Before we jump into this episode, I want to remind you that while Caitlin and Sophia are dietitians, we're not your dietitians. This means the information shared in the Food Freedom Fertility podcast is intended to entertain, educate, and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care. This information is not intended to diagnose, manage, or treat disease. Always consult with your doctor before making any changes. Welcome to another episode of Food, Freedom, and Fertility. We are your hosts, Sophia Pavia and Caitlin Johnson. We are doing our Win Wednesday Summer Series, where we are interviewing people just like you, who wanted to be pregnant, maybe still want to be pregnant, who are working through this life of managing their health, watering the areas of their garden that are in need of extra love to flourish and bloom and become the mom that they've always wanted to be. Um, And we are joined here today by Maggie, which is very special because we are kicking off PCOS Awareness Month. It is the very first week of September, September's PCOS Awareness Month. And we have a very special PCOS story for you today with Maggie. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you for coming on. Maggie, um, I said this before we hit record, but... Maggie is like a bright life in my world because she's one of those people that like absorbed information, made it her own to the point where it impacted her life, family, fertility, those things, but then like continues to pour back into the trying to conceive community and in my opinion, is like a PCOS expert at this point in time. So <laughs> I'm so oh, happy thank you, to have Maggie here. She never thought, have too many of those. Yeah, we need more. So well, let- you're creating more, Caitlin, with your work. <laughs> <laughs> well, so give us like if we back up a little bit, when you were along your I'm wanna grow a family, do I have PCOS? Did you know you had PCOS before you guys started trying to conceive or was that something you found along the way? Um, I I didn't know that I had PCOS, but I wasn't surprised by it, if that makes sense. Um, I had never had regular periods um, really from, you know, my teenage years. Um, And I went on the pill pretty early because of that. Like my, I think this is a really classic thing that your doctor says, you know, we'll put you on the pill to help regulate your periods, um, which of course we know is not how it works. Right. Um, so I was on the pill for years and years. Um, and then when I came off of it to try to conceive, um, I realized that I wasn't ovulating. Um, I had before coming off the pill, I had read, um, I think it's called taking charge of your fertility. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd learned all about cycle tracking, um, which I just was fascinated by all of that. And so when I stopped taking the pill um, and I was trying to track my basal body temperature, realized I wasn't ovulating. Um, And so then I sought out help from um, a midwife, actually, who diagnosed me with PCOS. I love that. Wow. Was she working like in an OB office? Um, Just a midwifery office. Um, The law actually just changed here in North Carolina. But at that time, midwives had to work under the supervision of an OB. Mm -hmm. Um, So... There were, I think, four or five midwives in the practice, Mm -hmm. and then they had an OB office that they had like a relationship with, um, only doing hospital deliveries. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, midwives can can write prescriptions, and she referred me to go get the um, the ultrasound of my ovaries as part of the diagnostic process. Um, She prescribed me all the things that I needed, Um, but I really I wanted that um, midwifery model of care with the personal relationship that you're able to develop as well as a more holistic approach to your health. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. So in the kind of beginning process, you're working with a practitioner that you felt really like they heard you and were spending adequate time with you. And what did that feel like when you were getting information like, oh, this might be a little bit more of an uphill battle than we expected it to be? Mm -hmm. Well, my midwife, she's become like a personal friend. Um, she came to my son's, um, to our baby shower for our second baby a few months ago. Um, I think because she's such a wonderful, personable 
practitioner, um, I did feel supported, but I'll also say it was pretty overwhelming at first. Mm -hmm. As I started researching PCOS, I found, you know, there's a few podcasts and YouTube channels and books. Um, It felt like every decision I made all day long could have an impact on my hormones and on my fertility. And that was really overwhelming at first to, to learn about, you know, like the receipts that you get in a store, that's hormone disrupting chemicals on that paper and everything that you put in your mouth and how you exercise and how you manage your stress and how you sleep. You know, it felt like every single decision was really, really high stakes at first. Mm -hmm. Like the choose your own adventure book. That's like, (laughs) there's too many adventures. There's too many choices. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. exactly. It can become powering down the line. Like once you realize all these things can work and like you actually have a lot of control over what's happening and like this isn't just happening to you and all of that but I I just I like that you point out yeah at first it can be really overwhelming so for anybody who's listening yep <laughs> at first you're like if you're oh, overwhelmed gosh yeah. part it for doesn't kind of it doesn't stay that way right Maggie yeah. is that just to give them a little. It doesn't. And, and Sophia, that's a really beautiful reframing that these are all things you can take action on. So while it is overwhelming, it's also like, I have all these opportunities throughout my day to make a positive impact on my fertility. So that's mm-hmm. awesome. Caitlin, I, I wish I'd found your course sooner mm-hmm. because I loved that you, you break it down into like, here's a couple things to focus on this week. And then next week we're going to add this because my, my, instinct in my personality was just to dive right in and try to fix everything all at once, <laughs> which is, it's hard, you know? It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like all your taste preferences, how you've learned to cook, how you've scheduled your day, you know, as you talk about so many of these different things impact you. I think the other thing is just human nature is like, you're like, well, then if, if what I was doing wasn't working, then I need to switch to this other extreme that would work, except for seeing it more of like on a continuum that you can move closer to it or choose, you know, Sophia and I are always looking for the things that are quick wins that have big payouts, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, while there's probably something we could change about every meal of your day, if we start with breakfast, which will impact your energy level for the entire day, like that one small change can actually have like more of a domino effect. And so sometimes that like skilled practitioner can come in and go, I know you want to do everything, but if we hit this, this, and this first and just spend a few weeks on only these things like you're going to feel so much better. You'll, it won't feel like a big mountain to ask you to do this other thing. Like meal prep, we can tackle in a few weeks once we get you eating solid breakfast. I want to take a minute out of this episode and talk to you about our partner, Fertility Cloud. We decided to partner with Fertility Cloud this season because we have worked with women all over the nation and we have heard the same issues arise again and again. My doctor can't see me for another eight weeks. I had to wait three months to see a specialist and even then they didn't really tell me anything. Or there's no one in my small town that knows anything about my situation or can help me. And that's so common because unless you live in a major metropolitan area or a place that has grand medical universities, and honestly, sometimes even then it's still an issue, It's really hard to find fertility specialists who can give you tailored, customized help for your unique fertility situation. And that, my friend, is exactly what Fertility Cloud does for you. They offer everything you need, but right in your home because it's fully online. Another perk is they often have same day or next day appointments, so no waiting weeks and weeks and weeks in order to be seen by someone. And my favorite thing of all, really the piece de resistance and the reason we are partnered with Fertility Cloud for this season, is they have a love and a passion for helping families grow. It is why they do what they do. It is why they wake up in the morning. It is why they have this world-class staff who cannot wait to step in and help you along your journey. So if this sounds like what you have been dreaming of, click the link in our show notes and go to fertilitycloud.com for $50 off your first visit. You know, you don't have to be perfect every every day, every decision that you're making in order for it to be effective and to have a positive impact. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think in particular, if you have cycles where you ovulate and don't conceive, it's tempting to look back and say, well, oh, well, this one morning I had a bagel for breakfast without a great protein source. And that's why I didn't get pregnant this month. Right. And that's just not how it works. Not every mm-hmm. meal has to mean so much. It's not all a reflection of who you are as a person and the kind of mom you're going to be and whether or not you'll ever get pregnant. Like, and I see women there just now, I'm this morning, I made a post about PCOS awareness month that with just a simple tweet that was like, PCOS is not an infertility diagnosis. You can get pregnant with PCOS. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting all these comments from gals being like, I'm doing muscle testing this week and I've been eating all organic and I'm in my progesterone is still zero. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you are working. I didn't say this to her, but I'm like, you are working so hard on all the wrong things. Like you could be eating organic tortillas and brownies and candies and being like, I'm eating all organic and your PCOS is spiraling out of control because your blood sugar management is due to deep fried at that point. You could be eating a fast food lettuce wrap cheeseburger for breakfast. You could be eating a freaking egg McMuffin and be having a better outcome with your fertility than your organic steel cut oats with organic strawberry preserve that you're putting into it. And um, it just, I see so many times, especially with PCOS, these gals are working so hard in all the wrong ways. And uh, so just, I love that, like, Caitlin, this program that you do, it's like, let's take that effort and put it towards things that are going to actually move the needle and Mm -hmm. not be like, doing the equivalent of like folding all your dirty laundry before you put it in the washing machine. (laughs) I literally was just thinking like, do you ever get to that overwhelm and you're like, man, I really got to write that research paper or whatever that thing is. And you're like, yeah, but I do see this very small item on my to-do list I could work on first. (laughs) And you're just avoiding it kind of because it's the hard one. Oh, 100%. And I, I see that too. It's like, no, let's just zero in on that thing that you had, like, let's rip the bandaid off and work on the thing that's going to be most helpful. So Maggie, give us like a run up to what was happening before you started learning and implementing what you did in the fertility course. Like where were you guys at? What, what had you tried? What were you thinking about trying and how did the information, like, where did it insert in your journey? So I got my PCOS diagnosis from my midwife, as well as a hypothyroidism diagnosis. Um, And I I really do think that was helpful to get my um, thyroid levels under control. And so I started researching and Googling and just learning everything that I could learn and freaking out about all the things that I needed to change about my life. Um, And I I ended up working with a nutritionist um, locally as well who doesn't specialize in fertility, but she did help me with um, macronutrients tracking, um, my water intake. Um, I would rate like my um, stress levels for her as well as part of the daily sort of check-in. And I started weightlifting, um, which I had was a person who exercised before, but weightlifting was new to me. And I I really, really liked it. Um, And I know now from your course, Caitlin, that that was a really good exercise choice because it's not um, so intense as like interval training or something like that, mm-hmm. that it is better for me and and my fertility goals at the time. Mm-hmm. It also can kind of eat through the testosterone a little bit when you have excess testosterone, like it uses it in a way that then kind of like turns it off for other things you don't want it to do. Mm-hmm. And it's great for insulin resistance, like weightlifting turns on those big muscles that just gobble up and help your body use insulin more effectively. Yeah. And it's really empowering too. Um, you know, feeling like all these things I'm changing are, I, I can't see a difference just yet, but I can see that I'm getting stronger in the gym. I, I found that really helpful um, in that journey. Mm-hmm. And isn't it helpful as a mom now that you have to like lug your kids around and all their crap? It's so much easier to like walk up the hill at the zoo. Like Caitlin was talking about a few episodes ago that she had like, what four kids with you and all of their accoutrements and this like big hill at the zoo. And you were able to do this in like 
that is so important as a mom, like having some muscle. So you're not just this like limp noodle that's like falling down the stairs on your way out of the garage. A hundred (laughs) percent. My toddler is in a big mommy phase right now. So he just wants me to hold him all the time. And then if I also need to be, you know, carrying my four month old in his uh, car seat, I mean, that's like 45 pounds total. Totally. That's not even counting like, and then you have the diaper bag and then you have your water bottle. And Mm -hmm. then it's like, you're also pulling Mm -hmm. this like wagon full of crap and like, (laughs) feel like a pack mule. Yeah. Parenting is, is physical. It is very physical. So good. That's great that you started this habit like along the way. Yeah. Um, and my midwife also told me about a bunch of supplements to start taking. She gave me a list of like, I think it was like 15 that they recommend and just starred some ones that she thought would be really good for me, um, which mostly lined up Caitlin with what your course recommended for me as well. So that was really great. Yeah. And probably reassuring like, and, okay, multiple people are saying this could be helpful. Yeah. And that I was kind of, when I started your course that I was already doing a lot of the things, Mm -hmm. um, that, that you would recommend. Um, I have migraines and she recommended magnesium instead of the prescription migraine meds I was on at the time. And that's been fabulous. Like I've, I've had so much fewer migraine episodes taking magnesium than with the prescription that I was on years ago. I love that. Mm -hmm. And that's so easy, you know, and also great for blood sugar management. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. relaxation, yeah. sleep, just general energy. <laughs> so right. good. Right. So I was doing all those things that my midwife recommended. Um, I was working with the nu- nutritionist and getting um, my macros better balanced. Um, the macro nutrient um, ratios that she recommended was lower carb for me than with most people. Um, but I didn't learn about really balancing individual meals as much until I took your course, Caitlin. And then um, my midwife also prescribed me um, letrozole, which triggers ovulation. So I did that for three cycles. Um, And I was successful in ovulating on the letrozole, but we didn't conceive, which I know is, you know, a thing that happens. It's totally normal to have cycles where, you know, you get everything right and it just doesn't uh, result in a pregnancy and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so then my midwife referred us to, um, a fertility clinic that was local. Um, they did their kind of initial workup for us. Um, and then we had our first consultation, our first meeting, um, with them to talk about a plan. And by this point I was, I had done my three cycles of letrozole. I'd been doing your course, Caitlin, for at least six weeks, I think maybe more like two months. And, I took a break from letrozole while we were making this transition because we'd already done three cycles and letrozole, it kind of sucks. Like it, the hot flashes were really intense for me. Um, it just, you just feel off. Um, so the same day we had this appointment with the fertility clinic, I ovulated spontaneously and that's when my son was conceived. Amazing. That very same day. <laughs> Not a letrozole cycle. Just, Not, no letrozole, just me and blood sugar management and supplements and exercise. doing the best I could with the tools I had. I love that. So he's our, our miracle baby for sure. We are so glad you're enjoying this episode and we want to take a brief moment to talk about one of our sponsors, Fullwell. Fullwell is not only a reproductive nutrition supplement company created and formulated by a registered dietitian, but they are a company that has the highest quality standards. They use the most bioavailable ingredients in the right amounts to ensure that you're getting the most out of your supplement. And let me tell you about one specific supplement, the Fertility Booster. The Fertility Booster is a combination of adaptogenic herbs and powerful antioxidants. Oxidative stress is something that occurs in every single body, and when it's accumulated, it can deplete antioxidants. Upping the antioxidants in the body by turning on the antioxidant protection system through food and supplementation is one way to support the body's free radical defenses and better support fertility overall. Oxidative stress impacts all humans, and this is one thing I love about the Fertility Booster. It helps supercharge both egg and sperm quality. You've heard about stress and how it can impact so many things in our body and how so many people just say, hey, just relax and you'll get pregnant. 
Well, ashwagandha is actually an adaptogenic herb and it can help reduce cortisol levels and increase sexual function. So the next time someone tells you to just relax, you can say, hey, no, I don't need to just relax. I'm taking the fertility booster by full well and supporting myself in this way. When we talk about powerful antioxidants, one of them that is the king of the show is coenzyme Q10. In its reduced form, it functions as an antioxidant in cell membranes and lipoproteins, helping to optimize fertility. And the queen of the show, in my opinion, N-acetylcysteine. It's a supplement form of cysteine, a semi-essential amino acid that benefits fertility via its role as a precursor to glutathione. It can also support healthy cervical mucus. So next time you're ordering your full well fertility prenatal, make sure that you grab a hold of their fertility booster so you and your partner can get a healthy dose of these antioxidants and stress support. Use the code FFF20 at checkout to get 20% off your first order. And now back to our show. How was pregnancy? Pregnancy was great. Um, I felt really grateful for the experience. Um, I think because it took us a while to get there, um, it made me more excited for all those milestones. And I've been lucky um, to have pretty easy pregnancies um, I've hadn't have I've been I've had two kids now and I haven't had nausea in either pregnancy. Amazing. So that's awesome. Get out of town. Um, God bless you. Hey, can I rewind <laughs> you for a second though? Can we sure. hear your first positive, big fat positive story, and then what it was like to like tell your husband? We 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 sort of live for this crap. So <laughs> tell us, tell us that story. So, you know, it wasn't the first time I'd taken a pregnancy test <laughs> and I felt like every cycle that I ovulated, I was just making up or imagining or misinterpreting signs in my body that I would be pregnant, you know? Oh, everybody um, does that. Yeah. You're like, oh, my nipples feel different. Yeah. Because, you know, progesterone is high in the <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I did have one symptom, the cycle that I got pregnant that I hadn't had before, um, which was that I, my nipples were so sore, like I couldn't wear a bra. It was horrible. <laughs> and that lasted pretty far into the pregnancy, actually, like probably eight weeks, maybe 10. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm impatient with pregnancy tests. I definitely took it earlier than I should have. And I never waited until the full, you know, 14 day luteal phase. Um, but I, I just decided the next morning that I was going to take a pregnancy test. And so I, you know, I went, I was teaching at the time I stay home with our kids now, but I woke up way earlier than my husband at that time. Cause I had to get to school. And so I woke up, um, it was like a Tuesday, I think. And took the pregnancy test and it was positive. And I, I just kind of stared at it for a couple minutes, like really not absorbing. Cause I'd looked at so many negative pregnancy tests. I'm like, am I, am I really seeing this? Am I making this up? Um, and then I, you know, I cried of course. Um, and I just, I just went and woke my husband up and told him it wasn't a big, um, you know, I didn't surprise him with a onesie or anything like that. Loaded um, in on I a just balloon to or something like that. <laughs> Tie it to a dog's collar. Write it in fire. You know, I think that's so sweet, but I just wanted him to know as soon as possible. So I I woke him up and we, we cried together and then we went to work. So that was just a normal day. I love the rest of the day, but it felt like this beautiful secret that we had. Yeah. This exciting. Everybody, this is what everybody wants. And I just slammed the Jesus out of my kneecap on the desk. In case you heard that (laughs) slam. This desk. Plus chair combo is it's a knee slammer. So was the midwife that you had been working with, you know, getting your diagnosis, managing your medicines, was this midwife the midwife that cared for you in your prenatal visits and delivered oh, there assisting the delivery? Yes. Yeah. Um she well, she was part of a practice at that point with, like I said, four or five midwives. So I had to have visits with all of them because you don't know who's going to be on call for you um, when you go into labor. Um, but she did most of my visits. I, I usually asked for her. Mm-hmm. The other ones were, were awesome. but um, And then she was the midwife who attended my first son's birth. Um, and then for my second baby, she had moved to a new practice where she was the only midwife. So I saw her for every appointment. And then um, she was there as well at his birth. 
I love that. Wow. So, so can we hear yeah. about your second baby? Like what it was like to try, because you weren't starting from square one when you're trying for baby mm-hmm. number two. So can you tell us a bit about that experience? Well, we, we didn't really try very hard for Jasper, which is awesome. Um, we had just started thinking, I, Henry was eight months old. And I was starting to get baby fever again. And so we'd started talking about maybe trying again. Um, This is around when Henry started sleeping through the night too. So I wasn't nursing overnight anymore. Um, And so I said, okay, well, he's not, I'm not nursing overnight. That's a normal time for people's periods to come back sometimes. So I started, you know, wearing my temp drop again um, and just, you know, just tracking casually. And, um, and so I, thought that I was about to ovulate when he was like nine months old. And so my husband and I had talked about it and said, all right, let's, let's just try and see what happens. And I, I don't think we assumed it would work so quickly this time. Um, but I did ovulate that time and we did conceive. So the very first time that we tried after, uh, after Henry was born. And had you had your cycle before that? Like, had you had a full cycle? Nope. So you never even had a period? No, I haven't. I that. haven't had a period since January of 2021. Stop. <laughs> that is hilarious and awesome and I mean Caitlin and I relate to this a little bit like we both got our cycles back you know maybe not regularly or something in between pregnancies but like all three of us here so Maggie Caitlin Sophia each of us like moved heaven and earth to get pregnant with our first and then our second baby was like, oh, okay, <laughs> here, here we go. I guess this is here happening. We go. Mm-hmm. You know, like definitely wanted more kids, but we're, it was like, we were open to life, but weren't like doing anything near what was happening to try to get pregnant with the first. So that's funny. We, we each have that. And listener, if you're feeling so discouraged because you're like, God, you know, this is the journey to get pregnant with my first baby. I I don't want to do this again and again and again to grow my family. You might not have to. Mm -hmm. It may not be so hard the second time. And Caitlin, you said something when I I messaged you that I got a positive test um, the second time. And you said, I said that I was surprised because I didn't feel like I was doing very much to try um, and to try to manage my PCOS. And I think you said that a lot of what I had changed probably had become habit and lifestyle for me. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't an effortful thing to manage my PCOS at that point. It was just habit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really true. And that that helped me to get pregnant quickly the second time. Yeah. I love that. Well, and again, like Maggie's like a self-appointed... I can't think of the word I mean. Not like, self-appointed, because that makes it seem like no, not in a bad she's way, in like any way. telling everybody that this is who she is. I, I think it's more like she's <laughs> she she's the uh, dietitian emeritus. She uh, an honorary <laughs> PCOS expert. Well, and so you're so in it, but it's also like when you know enough to be giving advice to people, like you've taken it in in a different way to then be teaching it right like you're a teacher you know this like when a student teaches another student they've really done more of a mastery level of something right like and mm-hmm. now it makes so much sense why you're so good at helping people because you ask good questions and you've studied the answers like duh maybe i forgot that you were a teacher i think i did know that at some point but um but yeah, like it is that way. You must have pulled more of this into your lifestyle. And something else that I see fairly frequently in a PCOS body is that as fertility is kind of turning back on, and this is similar to why I think that there is additional benefits of fertility as perimenopause is kind of starting in PCOS is your hormones are just kind of coming back on to ovulate for the first time. That ovary turning back on, that ovary is who's producing most of the testosterone in your body too. And so you may not have the perfect storm of lots of follicles maturing, all those follicles making testosterone, impacting the health of other follicles within the ovary as things are kind of like turning back on and getting back online. 
Okay. As those things start coming back on, if you have those few healthy eggs and you don't, they're not being bogged down by all these other follicles that are stuck in puberty, making all this testosterone, like you may have a better egg quality as someone with PCOS as your fertility start turning back on. It's similar to like when some people come off the pill with PCOS. Sometimes it's easier for people with PCOS that come right off the pill to get pregnant that first one or two cycles. It's also why like I've read a lot of literature on why there's this like extra benefit of fertility for people with PCOS towards the end of their fertile years. It's kind of the opposite. It's like as things are st- shutting down, there's less of this lots of extra testosterone. Mm, it's almost like you're getting to a baseline. Yeah, you come closer to what somebody else might be a normal. So I think there's probably some level of all of that. So in other words, my ovaries were like on hold while I was pregnant and breastfeeding. Yeah, they were quiet. Before, since you hadn't had a period yet, we can assume that this was the first egg that was ovulated since Henry. So this was kind of the first time things were coming back up online, right? And so the first time your body's sending a signal that I have a little egg and then your brain starts saying follicle stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. And so the few eggs that got pulled from your like vault were the only ones that had hormonal output because most of the estrogen in your body, most air quotes, and most of the testosterone in your body are actually made by those follicles. Yeah, but it's a much smaller scale. We're talking about like a dripping faucet versus like a spraying hose. We're taking a break from this episode to talk to you about one of our wonderful sponsors called NutriSense. So this isn't just another health trend. This is a program that helps everyone take control of their health and fertility by making lasting changes based on their unique needs. NutriSense is loved by over 100,000 members, and it offers a unique combination of expert nutritionist support from credentialed experts with continuous glucose monitoring data insights. So it's science plus a human touch and offers one-on-one support from the expert nutritionist team at NutriSense. So basically what NutriSense does is it gives you the support you need along with the data that you're getting from a continuous glucose monitor. Combining those two together with NutriSense offers you a science-backed way to take control of your health unlike anything else out there. It's access to the continuous glucose monitor as well as guidance from a nutritionist so that you can interpret this data and turn it into lasting results in your body. If you've listened to this podcast for more than 90 seconds, you know that we really don't believe in like a one size fits all nutrition plan and that things really need to be tailored to an individual for their personal health and fertility goals in order to succeed. And that's really what NutriSense offers. If this sounds like something you're interested in, which P.S. you should be interested in this, head over to NutriSense.io slash FFF and use the code FFF50 to get $50 off your first month with NutriSense. Right. So as kind of things are coming back online, similar to coming back online after everything being turned off on birth control, or as things are coming down from a higher amplitude of something like lots of hormones, lots of hormones, lots of hormones, fertile years, as your egg reserve goes down and you have less eggs doing all that work, you kind of it's a similar scenario where there's not as much pumping hormones. And I think that there's an argument that maybe early on as your fertility is turning back on after a baby, there's some egg quality advantages because there's not a lot of this like extra testosterone pumping around the ovary. Not to diminish what I said to you before, where I'm sure a lot of this was habit and lifestyle change that's just become second nature to you. Um, it, but I, also, I wouldn't have said that to everyone, Maggie. Like you're, you know, you're the star student in my Cream opinion. Of the crop. Just, oh. You are. Like I, thank I, you, Caitlin. That's said kind. This before we hit record, like I have a crush on Maggie. Like I have a <laughs> <laughs> in the best way, right? Like, don't go weird, audience. I just love this girl. <laughs> 
So then you got pregnant with baby number two. Talk about the pregnancies. Were they similar? Were they very different? You had a baby still when you were starting to be pregnant with Jasper. So yeah, so they're um, they're eighteen months and four days apart. So <laughs> um, really close age gap, which is which has been super fun. Um, pretty similar pregnancies. Um, in neither pregnancy did I have any nausea. Um, I didn't have the nipple soreness the second time, which was better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I had a little bit, but not to the same extent at all. Um, I think because there's a lot in your first pregnancy that your body has to do to get ready to breastfeed for the first time. And then the second time, you know, you, you don't have as much preparation to do, I guess. Were you still breastfeeding when you got Yeah, pregnant? I was breastfeeding. Um, my milk supply dropped really dramatically though, when I got pregnant the second time. Yeah. So, um, I had to wean Henry a little earlier than I planned to, mm-hmm. um, which was a bummer, I, you know, really grateful that breastfeeding worked for me. Cause I know it doesn't for, mm-hmm. for everyone with PCOS. And it, there's always a light and a dark side of everything, right? Like and, mm-hmm. and I'm pregnant and there's this brother you're going to have your whole life. Sorry. You got two months less of breastfeeding or, you know, and yeah, you got to exactly. play the hand you have, like once you're pregnant, you're pregnant. Like you, you say your milk supply mm-hmm. goes down. That might just be what it is. Um, But I think it's an important thing to bring up because I have worked with a lot of women that are like, my breastfeeding journey with this baby is more important than how I want to space things. And so, you know, somebody who's listening to this maybe may make an informed decision having a little bit more information like this could impact my – it's not 100% that you having another pregnancy is going to stop breastfeeding. Like Sophia breastfed – Natalie through most well, of Well, my breast- milk went away, but her desire to continually suck at the teat did not. So she kept <laughs> going. Right. And there- <laughs> it didn't stop her. So she kept going right through it. And I just pushed through. I had that nipple soreness too. And I just, just soldiered on. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Caitlin. And uh, it, yeah. And so sometimes it's like, okay. I, I want my children to be close together, so I'm not going to be preventing pregnancy, um, but I'm also not going to wean as a part of my get fertile faster plan because mm-hmm. I have an obligation to my baby that is instead of my baby that I want to be down the line. Right. And so that's something that I not only see frequently, but really applaud is that like taking the time to let your baby be a baby. I mean, you when you get pregnant, you get pregnant and it's a done deal, like Caitlin just said. But yeah, like there's weaning, no judgment in any way. No, weaning early for the purpose of trying, weaning before your baby's ready for the purpose of trying to get pregnant as fast as humanly possible is you know, a different and, thing. And people have their values. We're, we're not here to judge one way or another, right? Like you could be 39 with your first baby trying to get another baby and time is of the essence. I mean, it's not our place to tell you what's right or wrong, but it just, it's totally something true. to bring up because breastfeeding impacts hormones. And, mm-hmm. you know, Maggie, you said he started sleeping through the night and that probably was a huge piece to your cycle even turning back on because your body had a signal. He doesn't need me as much. Right. So like mm-hmm. it, it, that is a huge time when people's ovulation turns back on is once baby starts sleeping through the night. Baby sleeping through the night one time and then going back to waking up a bunch of times sometimes is enough to turn somebody's cycle back on. So it's also something like if you're like, oh, you know, my husband's about to deploy and I'm this and I'm that and I can't be pregnant with the baby and, you know, while I have this toddler, like it's, it's just things to know that honestly we don't talk about these things enough. And so it's not really, I'm not bringing it up for a judgment, but more so that like they're questions. And you have to choices and yeah. you get to make them bits based on your values. So it's like, something to think about. And also that people with PCOS, people with fertility issues the first time, again, you may not have issues the second time. And so you might think that doesn't necessarily apply to me. I'm not going to have this problem where I get pregnant um, the first time I try and have to wean my child faster. That could be Mm -hmm. you. You know, Mm -hmm. I feel like I I heard these kinds of stories when I was trying to conceive of people who just got pregnant, um, without really trying very hard after their first. And I was like, that's never going to be me. And, and it was, Mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, that's an empowering thing to think about that you could be this person with this amazing fertility story. 
Yeah, it's you're, it could totally flip. I literally am the product of that. My mom and dad tried so hard to have my sister. She's six years older than me. They just tried so hard to have my brother. He's 15 months older than me. And he, they had a six-month-old, five-and-a-half-month-old, I think, and they went on vacation. And they stayed in a hotel or something where they, like, opened the drawer next to the bed and there were all these condoms. And they laughed and didn't use one because they don't get pregnant. And, like, nine months later, the – Miracle of Caitlin. I'm kidding. The <laughs> but miracle like, of <laughs> it's true. Oh. But it's no, but like, really, for them, it really was because they tried so hard and things were just so different back then. I'm sure my mom had PCOS, but like, oh, it, 100%. Knowing your mom, definitely. Mm-hmm. But, but who's going to diagnose, especially 40 I mean, years ago? I mean, 40 years ago, and your mom being who she is, she's a little bit crunchy and a little bit rub some dirt on it, and like you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. She's not the right. mom that was like rushing kids to the doctor every time they sneezed or rushing herself to the doctor every time. I mean, she's no. she's a she's a tough tough old gal. She's yeah, but gal. she would say like it was an act of God for them to get pregnant with Patrick and Molly and. And so it's just an interesting part of the conversation, right? Is like you can even think you're the one that's infertile and you'll never get pregnant so easily. And you could. For sure you could. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that's Mm -hmm. pregnant with twins right now after she so struggled for her first. And it's way sooner than they wanted. (laughs) So it's just like. That is crazy. (laughs) Twins? Twins. I got a friend pregnant with twins right now too. God bless her. She's already got two boys. I'm a twin. You're a girl, twin, and she's got two more mm-hmm. boys. Are you fraternal or a? Uh, yeah, we're fraternal. Boys. Yeah, my mom was on Clomid when she got pregnant with us, mm. so I kind of I suspect she has PCOS too, but it has never been diagnosed, right. and she's postmenopausal now. So I don't know if that would be relevant at all. It could be but, actually, and that's an, maybe we should do yeah. an episode on that. But yeah, I mean, the while your ovaries aren't doing the crazy testosterone once they kind of shut down the impacts of exposure to high levels of insulin throughout your life and like and we'll you'll see it on social media this month you'll get scared about all the things like you have higher risk of heart disease and all these things so for someone like that working on anti-inflammatory diet lots of fruit and vegetables mm-hmm. healthy fatty fish like the things that are healthy for us now are still going to be healthy for her later, but really focusing in on insulin resistance is something, especially postmenopausal, like those things just start being harder for your body to do everything in that age. And so it's, it's helpful. I actually had an intern over the summer who did a paper on high protein diets in perimenopause. And, um, it was very interesting to see the research showing like in menopause, perimenopause and postmenopause, um, the impact of a high protein diet on less risk of like falling down and breaking your hip, body mass retention, like all these things that are, can be so beneficial. Um, so, um, you know, insulin resistance and managing blood sugar is important your whole life. PCOS diagnosis or otherwise, really. Uh, I'm still trying to squeeze in another baby under the buzzer, right? So I'm not ready for menopause just yet. Though I do have big dreams for menopause. I, It has scared me. I've watched the women of my family go absolutely bananas, like lose their minds, become this like insufferable ball of nerves when they go through menopause. And I just don't really want that to be me, right? And so I'm trying to like, put a better spin on menopause and be like, well, once I'm done having babies and have menopause, then I can get this like cool car that really won't work with the car seat. Then I can get this really fluffy, ridiculous big dog that it would be really annoying to have with small kids. And like, yeah, that's what I'm going to drink coffee all day and wine all night when I don't have to be fertile. Make anymore. estrogen. <laughs> yeah. I, there's a book Laura Lara Bryden wrote on – she wrote a – she's a naturopath, lives in Australia. She wrote a book on um, the period repair manual, and then she wrote a follow-up called the hormone repair manual, which is basically perimenopause and mm-hmm. menopause. And she talks about it as like 
you know, culturally it's so taboo to talk about. We don't talk about postpartum. We don't talk about puberty enough with kids. Like all these P's are very taboo. Perimenopause and menopause included. And she tells this story about being in med school and like having a hot flash and like being embarrassed about it and sitting with other doctors and thinking like, this shouldn't be this thing that like people are like, oh, menopause, don't talk about it at the lunch table together. And one of the things that this reframe she has in this book is so cool. And it talks about how as women age into this period of no longer being able to produce, they are like the thing that keeps cultures flowing because they now have energy and resources and ability to pour into the next generation. So almost like the grandma effect a little bit, but not just in grandmas and anyone that's no longer spending all this energy making hormones and then building babies and then breastfeeding babies. You now have this energy and vitality and you get to this point in your life where, excuse my French, all of our Christian listeners, like you just don't give a fuck anymore. You're like, oh, you don't like me and my boundaries. Sorry. Don't come to this party then, right? Like, like there's this incredible time <laughs> in a woman's that happening life. A lot. Like just gonna straight up fart going down the aisle of the grocery store, just like <laughs> don't care. Crop dusting the pasta aisle, like, okay, menopause woman. <laughs> Truly Damn. though, like I think I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm like Great sex into my body, loving what it is, boobs sagging and all, like perimenopause, menopause, it's going to be my time. <laughs> Farting in it. the grocery store. Crop dusting wait. the pasta. <laughs> oh. What, are, what the hell are we talking? We're supposed to be talking about Maggie's fertility story. Where, where have we gone? Maggie, yeah. reel us back in, please, for the love of God. <laughs> Well, so I was going to say that this this journey really, I think, has healed a lot of um, issues I've had with my body over my life. Um, you know, getting that PCOS diagnosis and being like, oh, it's harder for me to lose weight than for people who don't have PCOS. That is affirming to me that I'm not lazy, right? I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. Um, it's just that my body is different from other bodies. Um, and then while I was trying to get pregnant, I, I felt like this kind of adversarial relationship with my body sometimes of like, I really want to be a mother. I really want to be pregnant. Why is my body not allowing me to do this? Like letting um, you down almost. Exactly. I felt let down and disappointed. Um, and, but then I did get pregnant and it was like, it healed this, this relationship with my body in so many ways of like, yeah, I can actually get pregnant and have a healthy pregnancy and have a beautiful baby. Um, I think that that set me up for a better feelings about my body postpartum, because I think we can all attest your body is not going to be the same after you have a baby. Um, even if you do return to your pre-pregnancy weight, you know, there's going to be stretch marks, your hips might be larger than they were before. And that could be a permanent change. You know, your feet and your hands can be larger be and that can be a permanent change. At the end of time. <laughs> Right. And all of that is um, something that I I wanted, right? I desperately wanted to be pregnant. I desperately wanted to have that experience of watching my body change while my baby grew. And I did, right? And now I think understanding my PCOS has helped me to see my body as like a a teammate rather than an adversary. Mm -hmm. That we're working towards the same goals, and there are lots of things I can do to support my body rather than trying to fight against my body and my hormones. So excited to tell you that the PCOS app is sponsoring this podcast episode. The PCOS app is a one stop shop for all things PCOS, it's also your meal guide and inspo all in one. If you love listening to me on this podcast and you feel like, hey, I want Caitlin to be in my ear every day encouraging me about how to manage my PCOS, then you have to go download the PCOS app. We have curated articles to answer questions that you have about PCOS. There are short snippets in the PCOS Answers podcast exclusive to the PCOS app. We also have recipes where I not only 
give you the recipe, but teach you within the recipe itself what I have done to make it more blood sugar and hormone supporting so that you can take your own recipes and make them more PCOS friendly. If you've been looking for the Google of all things PCOS with the filter of compassion and expertise that you get from Caitlin Johnson RD, then you have found it in the PCOS app. Head to your Android or Apple store today, download it, and let's hang out. I love that um, reframe. And I hope that I think that's a beautiful place for us to start to bring this to a close is working with your body, partnering with her. She's the only chance you have at becoming a mom. And so if you hate her and think that she's stupid and resent her and want to punish her, you're not going to get very far. And even if you do get pregnant, you're going to be missing out on a lot. And there's, there's a lot more joy and peace that you could be having along the way. Mm-hmm. And um, why miss out on that? Maggie, you're just delightful. Thank you for your generosity. Right back at you. And coming on here. Thank you for being willing to share your story, for being willing to let us see that little baby float in and get fed and float back out. Just what a what a treasure. Well, thank you, Caitlin and Sophia. It's been a pleasure. So nice to connect with you uh, via video. Mm-hmm. I've been, you know, listening to y'all's podcasts and seeing both of you guys on Instagram a lot. So it's nice to yeah, we walk through grocery stores and get crop dusted too. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes if I get on a client after they like a, like a one on call with people, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, it's so weird." I'm like, "Yeah, I, d- I just pooped." Like, I just I'm like, "How can I take this star quality away?" I'm just a human. Wait, it. We didn't talk about that. I'm on antibiotics right now, and I'm spending half my day in the bathroom. Oh jeez. Oh no. Well, anyway, listener. <laughs> This has been another episode of Food Freedom and Fertility. If you liked this episode, if you think that there's anyone out there that could potentially benefit from this information, please rate, review, subscribe. Share it with friends. It helps other gals find us. Mm -hmm. We'll see you again next week. Hey, it's Sophia. If you love the show and want to continue your health and fertility journey using our resources, head on over to foodfreedomfertility.com for show notes, links to products and services, information about our guests, and our newsletter. Again, that's foodfreedomfertility.com. Thanks for listening.